We're continuing on our series um, on why God. And this morning we're going to read Psalm 13 uh, just to help us consider this subject that we started last week. Really about some of the questions we have in the midst of suffering and pain. So shall we all stand together and read Psalm 13 together? Okay, this is taken from the New International Version. Psalm 13. Okay, on the count of three now. Um, this psalm, you have to read it with emotion, okay? As the best you can, don't read it flat. It doesn't come out right, okay? <laughs> so read it with as much emotion as you can, trying to get yourself into the mood. Psalm 13, verses 1 to 6 on the count of three. One, two, three. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day with sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look at me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for He has been good to me. Father, we come before You and we ask You, Lord, by Your Holy Spirit, won't You speak to us. May Your voice be the voice that we hear and grant that we, Lord, will be responding to Your Word. Help us, Lord. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, the title, as it's there on the screen, as you can see, is uh, Why God Part 2. Now, if you find that a little bit bland and plain vanilla, maybe you might prefer this as a title. Okay? When pain is, when pain, not paint, when pain is present and God seems not. When pain is present and God seems not. Some years ago, actually some decades ago, when I was still a postgraduate student, uh, it was a Christmas gathering with all our Christians, uh, students from a church, and we were having a gala time. We sang all the Christmas carols, and we, and we were eating all the food, and uh, my pastor, I was still in Melbourne at that time, uh, my pastor said to me, say, hey, sing a song. Lah. I said, sing a song. Lah. We sang all the Christmas carols that we can remember already. Ah, sing like this, sing for some entertainment. Okay, you sure? Sing ah. Okay, you asked for it. And so I sang. This is what I sang. In a little while from now, if I'm not feeling any lesser, I promise myself to treat myself and visit a nearby tower. And climbing to the top Will throw myself off In an effort to make it clear to you What it's like when your heart is shattered Living in a lurch At a church where people saying My God, that's tough She stood him up No point in us remaining So we might as well go home as I did on my own alone again, naturally. <laughs> to think that only yesterday I was cheerful, bright, and gay. Who wouldn't, looking forward to, who wouldn't do the role I was about to play? But as if to knock me down, reality came around. And without so much as a mere touch, Cut me into little pieces, leaving me to doubt. Talk about God and His mercy. If He really does exist, why did He desert me? In my hour of need, I truly am indeed alone again, naturally. It seems to me that there are more hearts Broken in this world that can be mended, left unattended. What do we do 
what do we do? Looking back over the years and whatever else appears, I remember I cried when my father died, never wishing to hide the tears. And at 65 years old, my mother, God rest her soul, couldn't understand why the only man she'd ever loved had been taken, leaving her to start with a heart so badly broken. Despite encouragement from me, no words were ever spoken. And when she passed away, I cried and cried all day alone again, naturally alone again, naturally. And when I finished, well, there goes the Christmas mood, right? I didn't mean to put a dampener on the atmosphere. I sang that song then, and I sing the song now to remind myself that pain is very real. That there are people around us and maybe among us who suffer pain. And maybe not as courageously as the, uh, the, the, the lyricist put it, never afraid to hide the tears, not a, never to hide the tears. But the pain is still real, and the pain is still there. And there are some disturbing realities that we as the people of God and children of God have to live with in this world. When we, fee, when we see lives shattered, hurt, because of family dysfunctions, husbands and wives who can no longer live together, who can barely stand each other's presence, and divorces that leave, cho leave children wondering what's happened, and divorces and broken homes that leave children with a very flawed image of what a home ought to be, and they have no idea what a healthy family could be like. where tragedies shatter lives and cause dreams to evaporate before us. Illnesses that reduce a strapping young man into a bedridden vegetable. These things are realities in a normal society. Don't talk about Syria. Don't talk about South Sudan. Even in a normal society, there is suffering and there is pain. Perhaps not quite as loud and not on our front pages with shocking photographs, but they are there nonetheless. And perhaps many suffer quietly, in silence, perhaps in loneliness. And it is in those moments that questions about God arise. Why God? Why is this happening here? What's going on? Why does a God whom you Christians say loves us allow such things to happen to me? At those times, even sometimes we ourselves begin to wonder about God's love. And maybe just now when we were singing those choruses, some of you found it hard to sing some of those words because some of those words may ring hollow to you. And it's those times that are described by some as dark nights of the soul. Now, if you're uncomfortable with what I just described, that is exactly what is described by David, not in only in Psalm 13, but in elsewhere as well. 
where the absence of God seemed more tangible than His presence. And dark nights of the soul, I think, come to everybody at one time or another. What's my big idea this morning? My big idea this morning is simply that God is not absent in our pain and our suffering. God is not absent in our pain and our suffering. So, when pain is present and God seems not, what are we to do? Let's take a few cues from the psalmist. I think the first thing the psalmist encourages us to do is to acknowledge the pain. Acknowledge the pain. In this first two verses of Psalm 13, David cries out, How long, God? How long? Four times. He cries out, How long? How long? How long? Or like in the movie Shrek. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? How long, God? Are you here yet? Are you here yet, God? How long? The background to this uh, psalm is probably when David had been running away from Saul. I mean, David had been anointed as king, and he knew he was to take over as king some, at some point. But he didn't know that, he didn't expect that Saul would set out to kill him. And David had to run off to another country, to a neighboring country, to be effectively a, a refugee. And furthermore, humiliating to, to pretend to be out of his mind. Well, David was doing everything that he could to be right with God in still seeking to honor what God had said to him about one day becoming king and yet not dishonor the appointed king, Saul. And yet Saul was the one who was doing all the bad stuff, trying to kill him. And in his frustration, David cries out, Lord, how long? Where are you, God? Why are these things happening to me? Why are you not answering me? God, where are you? Hello? Anybody up there? The times when our prayers echo back, as it were. When we ask enough whys, the questions become where? We first ask God to explain Himself, then we wonder, is God even there at all? The pain of the silence and the absence of God is very real. I think many Christians over the ages have expressed that there are times when they felt that God is absent, that God has left the room. And this is what C.S. Lewis writes. Uh, in one of his later books entitled uh, A Grief Observed. And this was after he, this, his wife had died. And this, he, C.S. Lewis married late in life. And she met, he met this woman that he loved so much. But they didn't have very many years. And she died, I think, of cancer. And this is what he wrote. Where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms when you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing Him, if you turn to Him then with praise, you will be welcomed with open arms. But go to Him when your need is desperate, when all other help is in vain, is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. Hear this great Christian thinker whose works still impact people right to this day. This Christian, in his suffering of grief over the loss of his much-loved wife, expresses the pain 
of the silence of God in his grief. Most of us, we want to avoid pain. We want to excise it, cut it out of our lives like it's the problem. It's the disease. Pain is the disease. We cut it out. There's, an, there's a story of uh, this German theologian, uh, pastor and theologian, Helmut Tillicke. Uh, after he had toured, went around the United States, he was asked at the end of the tour uh, what he observed as the greatest deficiency among American Christians or among the, in the American church. And this was his reply. He said, you Americans have an inadequate view of suffering. You have an inadequate view of suffering. Uh, ironically, today, I think that must have maybe been 40 years ago. I'm not quite sure. But today, America is facing what they call an opioid crisis. There's a crisis where over, I think, a thousand people a day or maybe less, hundreds of people a day, die from overuse of opioids, uh, painkillers, prescription and non-prescription painkillers, very powerful painkillers. People die from overusing this. It's become the the new drug epidemic in America. Um, Not illicit drugs. These are all legally bought drugs made by pharmaceuticals. And it's painkillers. People are killing themselves from killing themselves from their pain. What an irony. An inadequate view of suffering. The idea that pain is such an undesirable thing, they would do everything they can to excise it, exorcise it from their lives. Yes, pain is real, but pain has a function. You know, in our bodies, we have pain to tell us that something is wrong. It would, it would be unwise of us to ignore pain. A pain is the alarm system. Imagine if the, you know, the alarm system went off. We all just sat here and said, what an annoyance. Oh, just turn off the alarm, you know. Let's just give it some opioid and turn off the alarm. And we just continue to sit in here while our, you know, roof burns up and that hall feels... What an annoyance. Turn off the sound. Turn off the sound. Pain is an alert system in our bodies. It is not the problem. It alerts us to a problem. One of my colleagues uh, last week came up to me and showed me his hand. He said, whoa. His hand was shaking. He said, whoa. I said, what's wrong? He said, whoa. Pain lah. Whoa. Now, this guy is not a... Okay, that's the, he's not a wuss, you know, American parlance. Uh. He's not a wuss. He's not a like, oh, everything is so painful. No, he's not one of those guys, okay? So, it's like, oh, they say, wow, it must be very painful, eh? They say, say what's, why? Don't know lah. Say, last week it was like, ah, discomfort. Then a little bit numb. What, today pain? Wow. I said, better go see doctor, eh? You know, so I said, go see lah. So he went and saw a doctor. So later in the afternoon, he came back, you know, hand bandage. Wow, what happened? The doctor said, dislocated finger. I said, what? <laughs> You've been walking around with a dislocated finger for three, four days? My, stupid are you? <laughs> okay, I didn't quite say that. Lah. Did I? Okay. Remind me afterwards. Okay, but it's like, hey, that pain is there for a reason. Imagine if, like, oh, no problem. Real man. Don't worry about pain. I mean, if you had gone a few more days like that and just ignored the pain, like, no way, I will overcome. I wonder what would have happened to his hand. Perhaps the damage would have been far greater. Pain is to alert us to a problem. Pain is not the problem. Isn't that also the case with emotional pain? That emotional pain or the pain of the heart itself is not a problem. It only points to there being a loss. Someone grieves because there is a loss. The grief is not the thing that hurts. The grief is the pain that you feel. But the hurt is in the loss. 
Pain is not the problem. Pain points to a problem. In fact, um, one writer uh, by the name of uh, Scott Peck who wrote the book, uh, the, Lo- the Road Less Travel, uh, he wrote this. Uh, he's a psychiatrist, I think. He wrote this. He said, the symptoms and the illness are not the same thing. Duh. The illness exists long before the symptoms. Rather than being the illness, the symptoms are the beginnings of its cures. The fact that they are unwanted make them all the more a phenomenon of grace, a gift of God, a message from the unconscious, if you will, to initiate self-examination and repair. I thought, that's so eloquent. Pain is a gift of God to alert us and to awaken us to something that needs to be addressed. Pain calls for attention crucial to health and healing. Pain is not the problem. The pain of guilt is there to drive us towards seeking to make things right, to seeking forgiveness, to perhaps seeking reconciliation. The pain of loneliness is to move us towards seeking genuine relational connections. The pain of emptiness and meaninglessness is to drive us towards seeking meaning and purpose. The the pain of spiritual thirst and hunger, as you might experience in what is called the spiritual wilderness, might be there to drive us to God. The Desert Fathers tell us, or tell us through their writings, that it is in the wilderness that our spiritual experiences of God are nourished. That when some of these pains in our lives put all the distractions of the pleasures of life aside so that we focus on the needs of our soul. Pain is like a neon light pointing God, God, God that way. Pain calls us to pay attention, crucial for our health. In the physical sense, that's always true. But perhaps also in our spiritual health, in our wholeness as a human being, Pain calls us towards that. Pain is not the problem. Pain is an alert system. Pain is a neon sign pointing us towards God. Pain is, when pain is present, acknowledge the pain. My big idea is that God is not absent in our pain or our suffering. The second thing we could do is to pray your pain honestly. Pray your pain honestly. And I think this is what the psalmist does. And this is not the only place that he does it. If you read the psalms, and, and this is one of the reasons why I love the psalms, okay? And I love to do not read the psalms not only in a, a modern version, uh, but in a contemporary version even. Because you need to hear uh, the pain in the psalm. These were not guys who were just like mechanical songwriters, you know? These were the cries of their heart. Can you hear the cry of David? He said, how long, God? How long? Are you going to leave me here? How long? And he translates his pain into, oh, God, help. Isn't that what uh, verse 3 and 4 says? Answer me, Lord. Answer me. You've got to come through. Give light to my eyes. Help me out here. Otherwise, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. If if I die, your enemies are going to triumph. And they'll say, oh, we overcome him. God. And he's still in pain. He's not saying, oh, God, you're going to come through, right? No, he says, God, are you going to come through? Please, come through. 
He translates his pain into a prayer of petition. But it's a painful petition. It's a pain-filled petition. God is not turned away by our honest prayers. God is not turned away by our honest prayers. Now imagine if David had come to God and says, <clears throat> okay, I've got to sort out my emotions. Don't bring my raw emotions before God. Sovereign Lord, maker of the heaven and the earth, blessed art thou. Hear your prayer. Hear the prayers of your servant, O God. Oh God, help! Ah! What he's feeling on the inside would not be matched by what he seemed to be saying on the outside. David doesn't seem, or the psalmist doesn't seem to have any problems whatsoever taking what they are, oh, the turmoil in their hearts and pouring out in prayer before God. And that is really, for me, one of the reasons why I love the psalms. Because there you see humanity reaching out to God genuinely. Not in religiosity, but in honesty in all the messiness of life coming before God. And God's not turned off. I don't think so. For example, in Exodus chapter 5, Moses prays a prayer that we would probably be shocked at. You know, the, most of us will know the story of Moses, right? God comes to Moses and says, Moses, go to the Pharaoh of Egypt, the most powerful man on earth. Don't worry about that. Okay, he's got a big sum here. Don't, don't worry about that. Go and tell him, let my people go. Okay, tell him, let my people go. Just go and do it. So Moses does. God says, no, I do lah. He goes, tells the Pharaoh, let my people go. Okay, Pharaoh says, go home, you. Okay, and then say, wow, all these Israelites, huh? so much time on their hands huh, to entertain this possibility of going out to the desert and do their festivals. Ha, we'll double their workload. So they double the workload, okay? And then the Israelites say, oh my goodness, Moses, what do you do? Huh? You really messed up our employment contract. Now worse. Uh. Okay, so they got angry with Moses. And Moses is like, huh? God. He goes back and this is the prayer he prayed, right? Moses returned to the Lord and said, why Lord? <laughs> why have you brought your, your people? Are you, I seem not bad enough, uh. Huh? Is this why you sent me? Song Seya. Translating into Cantonese, huh? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on these people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Now, this is right at the end of chapter 5. I thought if you turn the page over to chapter 6, verse 1, huh, you will have read the story of. God would have struck Moses with lightning and turned him into a crisp. How dare you talk to me like that? How dare you say I have not rescued my people? Are you suggesting I have no intent whatsoever? Are you suggesting that I'm lying? Oh, you turn to a chapter, no such action, okay? God, very nice. God said, chill, Moses. Just go back. Just tell him the same thing. God is not turned off by our honest press. I mean, Moses was frustrated. I said, God, you say you'll rescue. But he didn't know, of course, that God had a, you know, it would turn out to be a somewhat long rescue process. Lah. So you imagine his frustration, right? And God was not turned off by that honest prayer. Are our prayers honest? Or do we come before God with a facade of religiosity. And this, this, all's got to be good before God. You know, don't disturb Him. Don't upset Him. Okay? Make sure we say nice things to God. When I read the Psalms, I don't think they say nice things to God sometimes. They say, God, where are you? Ah? Why are you like this one? Huh? Our honest to God prayers are the kind of prayers that's needful for our own health and healing. Our honest to God prayers. The prayers that cry out, God, where are you? 
I'm hurting. Why aren't you doing anything? Lord, it's really, really bad. I'm dying here. I have no hope. Where are you? Why do I say our honest to God prayers are necessary for our, and needful for our health and healing? Because it's necessary for us to talk our pain. We can talk our pain with people. But I'd like to tell you that when you talk your pain with God, He's not going to turn you into a crisp. He's not going to. He's not turned away by our honest prayers. And in fact, you know, our soul begins to cleanse, as it were, begins to be purged of those unhealthy thoughts as we begin to come before God honestly with all the, you could say, rubbish. Yeah. Oftentimes when we are in pain, there's a lot of rubbish in our hearts, stuff that we know we shouldn't feel, we shouldn't think, but it's there and it's got to come out. And it's got to come out to be set aside but we keep it all in, we'll only grow bitter against God. If we learn how to pray our pain, offload, maybe you could say upload our pain to God, we might be a whole lot less difficult on the people around us. Our marriages might be better if we learn to pray our pains rather than nag our wives or, or wives nag your husbands or nag to your neighborhood gossip club. Our relationships might actually improve if we learn to pray our pains honestly before God. God can handle our pain. It's not oftentimes that we can say other people can, but God can. God can handle our pain. God can handle our unreasonable statements about our pain sometimes. One of the great lessons of the Psalms is that it is okay. It is okay to be honest with God about how you feel. God already knows, and it doesn't make sense for us to try and hide it from Him. All we're doing in trying to hide it from Him is to deny, kind of like deny His existence for ourselves. We are trying to deny pain in our lives. And when we share what I would consider our naked wounds, you don't dress it up, you don't try to hide his ugliness from God. When we share our naked wounds with God, we actually grow in intimacy with Him. When we share our naked wounds with God, we grow in intimacy with Him. Isn't that true in, in all relationships? is that when we share only the good things of our lives with each other, like sometimes husbands and wives do, you know, when you're courting, all nice lah. <laughs> I'm trying to you to buy me ma, okay? You know, make a sale. Of course, it's all nice things. Now, if you continue after that in marriage, it's not going to work because you're just keeping a lot of other stuff buried underneath. You're trying to suppress all the stuff. But, but when, you, when you know you're in your marriage, when you're living with each other, right? Those things kind of leak out here and there. It's when we share ourselves nakedly, so to speak, with each other that we grow in intimacy. It's not an easy thing to do. It's hard. But that's when intimacy comes from. And in our relationship with God, it's when we share ourselves nakedly before God, when we share our naked wounds and pains before God that we grow in intimacy with Him, that we have chosen to be vulnerable before God, to say, God, I'm not really good at trusting you. God, I, I know I should. I, 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 I'm constantly told you love me, but God, I don't always feel that you do. And I'm not always, I can't always say that I will. <laughs> I worry that I won't follow you to the end, God, because I know I'm weak. I'm, I, I know I mess up all the time. When we choose to be vulnerable before God is when we grow in intimacy with Him. When we choose to be religious before God, then our relationship with God remains a religious one.
when we share our naked wounds with God, we grow in intimacy with Him. My big idea has been, God is not absent in our pain and suffering. He is not absent. He may seem absent, but He is not absent in our pain and suffering. He is not turned away from it. He is not disgusted by it in any way. He is not frightened of it. He's not disgusted by it. He's not turned away by it. He is not absent in our pain, in our suffering. When pain is present and God seems not, acknowledge the pain. Don't pretend that it's not there. Acknowledge it before God. But also pray your pain honestly. Say it as it is. Say your heart as it feels. It might seem unkind, but that's how you feel. But thirdly, and this is not from the psalm, but I, I, I thought I, I really need to include this. So when pain is present in our community, we need to carry each other's pains. We need to carry each other's burden of pain. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, Paul writes that we are to carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, Paul again writes, Rejoice with those who rejoice, no problems. That one. Happy birthday to you. For you is a jolly good fellow. For you is a jolly good fellow. But mourn with those who mourn. Carry each other's burdens. Mourn with those who mourn. We are supposed to be a community of healing. We are supposed to be a community. The church is supposed to be a community where we share each other's, Paul says, burdens. Share each other's joys and we share each other's sorrows. Where God seems absent is when the church needs to be very present. When God seems absent is when the body of Christ needs to be the body of Christ. The expression on earth of Christ here. Suffering people tend to have this idea and, and feel that God has left them. And from the quote I just gave uh, earlier on to you from C.S. Lewis, now if, it, if that had been the end of his book, right, uh, that would be rather sad that this great Christian thinker had come to the end of his life and concluded that God leaves you and you're in suffering. That would be rather, rather sad. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there because later he, dis he shares that in those times when he felt that God had left him alone in the absence of God, it was the church, the community of believers who restored the sense of the presence of God into his life. God makes His presence known to suffering people through His agents, His people, you and I. And of those of us who are suffering even here today, in pain today, we, the body of Christ, it could be a cell group, it could be a fellow Christian here in church or from another church. God's people, we are the agents of His presence here on earth. There is a reason why we are called the body of Christ. We are God, we are Christ's expression here on earth. God makes His presence known to suffering people through His agents, His people. Now we see that. We see that being really real when, when Christian aid agencies go out there and give aid to suffering people on different parts of the world. That's really a good example, but that's a rather extreme example. But what's a more common, what needs to be a more common example is we're right here in a normal society where there is no war, where there is no famine. It's just the normal stuff of life. And the sufferings of the normal stuff of life, death, loss, disappointment. And it is those places that where we, the people of God, 
need to make God's presence known to those of us here who are suffering. Now, in saying that, I, I, I thought I'd better give some pointers, you know, because um, I've seen examples where people try to be, bring comfort of God into a situation and, well, they brought discomfort instead. Okay, so I'm going to give you some practical pointers. If you're going to seek to be with a suffering person, acknowledge their loss. Acknowledge their loss. Okay. Whether it's the death they had suffered or relationships so shattered, there, is a, there is, appears to be no possibility of recovering that relationship. Don't say, don't worry, la, next year you can get a new husband. Oh, yeah, it's okay one now. You're such a terrible guy anyway. <laughs> Acknowledge the loss. And it's probably a, a good rule, okay? If you can't think of anything to say, probably best not to say anything. Because oftentimes, uh, many words in those kind of situations actually don't do any good. In fact, they do harm. Acknowledge the loss. You may not know what to say, but this... I'm so sorry for your loss. And just be there. Secondly, give the mourner permission to grieve and express emotion. Give permission to the mourner to grieve. And, you know, different people grieve different ways. Some people would take a long time. Some people just can't say anything. Some people would just sit there and cry. You know, for... And, and they will cry and sob. And, but that's their grieving process. Give them permission to express their emotion. Now, that may make you feel uncomfortable. It does sometimes feel very really uncomfortable. There's so much sorrow. Okay? Don't say, oh, you're, you're, enough lah, enough lah. Stop crying. They have every right to grieve. They have every right to mourn because their heart is broken. Free the grieving person to talk about the loss. Let them talk about their loss. Okay? You know, don't say, yo, tomorrow Christmas, uh, don't talk about such thing anymore. La. Chinese New Year next week. You know? Come, 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 come. Let's talk about something else. Hey, what do you want to eat for Chinese New Year? Huh? free the grieving person to talk about their loss. Because when you're in, those, in their shoes, everything else has faded into the background. And this is the only thing in the foreground. Chinese New Year will come next year. But their spouse or their loved one or that relationship won't be there. Allow them to express their loss. Other practical things? You know, uh, by the way, uh, one of the ways people process pain is to talk about it. They need to talk about it. They need to bring it out. And you will, you will discover that people who don't get to talk about it and just bottle it up, it does them harm. A psychologist will tell you that. They need to talk about stuff. The psychologist will make you talk about your pain. Get into the un uncomfortable details. Because it's through talking it out that you grieve. So being a good listener in those kind of circumstances provides a much-needed service to the people who are grieving. Offer practical forms of help. Practical forms like providing, helping them with meals, looking after their kids, uh, you know, ferrying their kids back and forth. When my wife was in hospital uh, some years ago for about 10 days, uh, I mean, I, I couldn't do anything for my kids, okay? For my two boys and my daughter, I couldn't do anything because I was at the hospital every single day, okay? And I thank God for my brothers and sisters who helped look after my children, <coughs> taking them to school, making sure they were fed, you know, taking them out to ice cream because I, was, I couldn't be there. And it was a very practical form of help. And you could do that to someone who is, who is in pain. Offer practical help. Don't just say, I'll pray for you, huh? Okay. 
Pray, la, pray, pray also, also pray. But, you know, ask, you know, you know, there's something specific I can do for you. Can I, you know, can I just help you with a meal? Uh, can I take care of the laundry? You know, someone did that for me, you know. Uh, can I do something like that? Can I help you with some of your chores? Offer practical forms of help. Other things you could do and you need to do is to follow up. Because the people who suffer loss, their lives never go back to normal. Their lives never go back to normal. Their normal is a new normal that they have to get used to. For us, we go back to our normal life. So we need to follow up with them because they're still going through it long after we, our second visit, our third visit. Those are the do's. Some of the don'ts. Don't make callous statements. Don't make callous statements. Don't say, I understand how you feel. Smack you up. Because you don't. You don't really understand how they feel. You may have an idea how they feel. You may appreciate how deep the loss may be, but you don't understand truly how they feel. It's better to say, I'm sorry for your loss. Don't attempt to answer the why questions because they will ask many questions, right? Why? Why did this happen? Why did he do this? And one of the toughest uh, wake and funeral situations I had to deal with was to do a wake and a funeral for uh, someone who killed himself. What do you say to the children who ask, why? How to answer that question? Because I don't know. And, and any answer I attempt is probably wrong. Don't attempt to answer the why question. You're not a philosopher. And you're not God. Don't attempt. Just say, I don't know. Because in all honesty, we don't know. We don't understand. Don't tell her to get over it. Because that's totally insensitive. Because once the world has fallen apart, you can't rebuild Rome in a, in a day, as they say. Don't tell them to get over it. Don't be, don't be shocked by off-the-wall statements by the mourner. It is not uncommon for them, for people in that situation, to make extreme statements. I had a friend who, who lost his mother and he rushed back. He, um, his mother lived in a certain part of town which is quite far away. And he rushed from the office to try to get to his mother before she passed on, but he didn't make it. So his mother passed on without him being there. And he was so heartbroken. He was so sad. And when I met him at the wake, he made this statement which kind of stunned me. He said, I wish it was my father who died. I'm like, now I knew he didn't have a great relationship with his father. But even so, I don't think he really meant that. But in his grief and in his pain, don't be shocked by off the wall statements by the mourner. Okay? So these are practical do's and don'ts, yeah? so that you will actually be a comfort to someone who is in pain. A big idea has been and is God is not absent in our pain and suffering. God is not absent. And definitely when we carry each other's burdens of pain is when God is present in and through us in that situation. In and through us in someone else's situation of pain and suffering, we bring the presence of God to them in a very tangible way. Recapping, when pain is present and God seems not, acknowledge the pain. Pray your honest prayers. Pray your pain honestly. And thirdly, when it is in the community, let's carry each other's burden of pain. Let's be the body of Christ. Let's be Christ to each other. But I want to close with the fourth 
statement to make, and it would be this. When pain is present and God seems not, trust and hope in God. Trust and hope in God. Now, I have to put this as last, because if I put this first, it would be seem totally insensitive. Don't worry, don't worry. Trust God. Smack you up. Okay? This is going to be the first thing you say to someone who is suffering in pain. Oh, you must trust God. Trust God. Hope in God. They won't hear you at all because they are so numbed, they're deafened by their pain. They won't hear you. It's only when we love them and we sit with them for hours and, then, and we hear their painful talking about their loss and their crying and their moaning. Only then it would be helpful to encourage them. And we hope that, of course, that someone who's suffering in pain would already be doing this. Trust and hope in God. The psalmist, out of six verses, this is where he ends. He says, but I trust in your unfailing love. The but changes everything. No longer is it about my pain. But here I'm beginning, I need to recognize you, O oh God, your unfailing love, your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for He has been good to me. Now, David recognizes that he has been an up and down a roller coaster of emotions about how he's feeling about the situation, but he returns back to the God who never changes. Like the song we sang, He never changes. Through the ups and downs and the vagaries of his emotions, he returns to the plumb line of God's character. He is faithful. God's steadfast love was what David needed to remember. We ask many questions, why, O oh God? Where? How? When are you going to show up, Lord? But we as God's people are not to live on explanations we expect of God to give to us. We are to live on God's promises, which He already given. His promises made out from His character, which He will fulfill. He doesn't owe us explanations, but He does owe us a fulfillment of the promises because that's wholly consistent with His nature. We need to trust God. What do I mean by that? Do I mean that at a time when one is suffering, that you somehow muster up all the trust and all the faith that you can and say, oh God, I trust you. It doesn't work that way. Trust. Trust. Our trust in God presently must be rooted in the past. And what do I mean by that? If you've never experienced God and you have no kind of experience of knowing God, it's really hard to trust God. I, 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 I was going to say I love those part of the movies, but I kind of like, ah, what a joke. You know those part of the movies where the hero grabs uh, a girl that needs to be saved right? Just met for the first time, he grabs her, they're about to jump out of the window of a 50-story building, and they say, do you trust me? <laughs> that's, 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 that's ridiculous. I don't even know your name. You're holding me at the edge of the, the you know, asking me to jump with you 50 stories down. Do you trust me? That's absurd. Ah! The, mm, that's not a question of trust. Do I have a choice? No. Nope. <laughs> you don't trust someone. You can't get to trust someone you don't know. Right? You can't trust someone you don't know. So our trust in God is rooted in the past. If you've already experienced God, it's when the times of pain that you have to go back and say, God was good. Just that David says, God has been good to me. Because He has been good to me, He will be good. If He's not good now, He will be good soon. 
As God has been, so He shall be because God is ever consistent. He is faithful. Our trust in God presently must be rooted at least, in this case, our own past experience of God. Okay, like, if you don't have your past experience of God, maybe trust in the experience of someone you trust. Someone perhaps who came to Christ and ex- brought you to Christ and he himself had experienced it. You trust this guy and he's telling you stories about how God has come through in his life. But it's got to be on something that's real. It's not mustered out of thin air. It's like, oh, I've got to trust, God, trust. No. Our trust in God presently must be rooted in the past. At least one, our personal experience of God in the past. But if we are lacking in that, one thing that will always be if you have trusted in Christ is we have a salvation past. We have a salvation past. God has been faithful. He cares. How do I know He cares? Because it says, God demonstrated His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If there were if, if our, we cannot remember our past experiences or our past experiences don't seem to seem so strong as to be the basis of our trusting God or it seems so hard to trust God simply on the basis of a little experience of God, then trust in God based on salvation past. Because Christ came down and walked this earth like we lived on this earth. He suffered the frailties of this human body who lived in a sin-infested society like we do, having to put up with people who are not the best, who suffered betrayal of friends, who were disappointed, who suffered ridicule and mocking, and real pain of lashings, and to suffer death because God cares for us. Our trust in God presently must be rooted in the past. But more than that, our hope in God must be rooted in the future. Our hope in God must be rooted in the future. You know, we just uh, celebrated Easter, right, two weekends ago. We have Good Friday and we have uh, Easter Sunday, right? And right across the world, uh, stuff happens on Good Friday, all kinds of stuff, Good Friday services, and then Easter Sunday, right? Easter Sunday, you know, even in the Klang Valley, near all the churches, wow, the roads all chalked up because people come to church on Easter Sunday. But we always forget that there's a Holy Saturday, the Saturday between Friday and Sunday. And for us, that's just like, uh, okay lah, nothing seems to happen, oh. But eh, tomorrow is Easter Sunday, yes, hallelujah. But for the disciples, Holy Saturday was a day of shattered hopes. Living with shattered hopes. Living with deep disappointment with big questions. Huh? Why? What happened? Where's the Messiah? What happened to all that He said? Many questions. Maybe many tears. Much brokenness of heart on Holy Saturday. We don't make a lot of it because we know, oh, after Saturday comes Easter Sunday. Oh, But for them who lived through it, after Good Friday, it wasn't good. (laughs) <laughs> good Friday wasn't good. It was bad Friday, man. And Saturday was dark Saturday. When hope has evaporated and all that had been the expectations of the last three and so years had just gone. What a long day that must have been. Very long day. And maybe for many of us, we are living in that Holy Saturday. We are living in the space between Good Friday 
and Easter Sunday. Our victory has not come. There is no jubilation of situations overcome. We are still in it. Our dreams are still shattered. There is still pain. There is still despair. Things are worse now than they were a few days ago, as it were. I don't know, maybe that was some, for some of us, that would be how we feel after GE 14, huh? May the 10th, I don't know. But many of us perhaps are living on that Holy Saturday space. The period where we are waiting. And I'm not sure I could say the disciples waited because I'm not sure they had expectations. To them, to them it was over. Now it's learning to live with the over. And you are perhaps in that space when we suffer in pain and suffering. But our hope must be rooted in the future. Now, I'm not going to say that tomorrow things will be great. But I will say that when Jesus returns, all will be well. When Jesus returns on that day, He will right what has been wrong. And if today we are dealing with brokenness in our lives, if we're dealing with broken bodies, we are dealing with the pain of having to deal with death, on that day when Jesus returns, that will be overcome. On that day when Jesus returns, death will be overcome. There will be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain. On that day. But until that day comes, it is still Saturday, as it were. Until that day comes, I know Sunday is coming, Easter Sunday is coming, but it's still Holy Saturday. But today, just like we are able to anticipate Easter Sunday, we don't have brokenness on Holy Saturday. We don't all mourn on Holy Saturday because we know Easter Sunday is on its way. But in the same way we live in this Saturday of our lives, we need to remember that Jesus will return and on that day, that will be like the Easter Sunday. It will be a day of rejoicing. It will be a day when death is overthrown and life emerges. On that day, hope will be fulfilled. But until then, we are in Saturday and all we have is a certain hope that Sunday will come. Our hope must be rooted in the future because if our hope is rooted in May 9, huh, by the way, okay, come May 10, wow, you could be disappointed, no. But our hope must be rooted in the future that we have in Christ, not in our electoral system, not in any party, not even in our government. Our hope must be rooted in the future that we have in Christ Jesus. That one day, death will be overcome. One day, there will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more mourning. One day. That's why Paul can write, I consider that our present sufferings this Saturday are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us and in us on Sunday. Our hope must be rooted firmly in the future. That's just another way of saying taking an eternal perspective. And when we take an eternal perspective, the temporal, our time here on earth, looks different. I often tell this story. You know, my wife loves to garden. Uh, when we lived in Australia, it was wonderful. For, you know, because we had a big backyard and, and uh, Melbourne weather was great. You know, you could, in summer, you could work there until 9 p.m. You still had light and it's not too hot. You don't perspire like crazy. Then my wife loved it. When we come back to Malaysia, Alama, whoosh, so hot, so hot. You know, you wish you have an air condition over the little, you know, we call it garden in Malaysia, right? Actually, it's only like, what? 10 foot by 5 feet, like, ugh. okay, pot. Now we live in a condo. Garden is flower pot. <laughs> and I know she loved gardening, so I, you know, I thought about it and said, hey, one day when Jesus returns and the old earth is gone and we have, we're now on a new earth, guess what? You have a garden. 
and the weather will be like Melbourne. <laughs> Hallelujah! Our hope is not rooted in this world. Our hope is not rooted in the having enough money to move myself to Melbourne and have a piece of land. <laughs> My hope is not rooted in a government that we pray for and beg God for that will be just and righteous. Ultimately, our hope needs to be in the future that is only available and promised to Christ Jesus. My big idea has been God is not absent in our pain and suffering. He is very present. We may not feel His presence because we may be deafened by our pain or numbed by our pain. But God is still present. When pain is present and God seems not, acknowledge the pain. Don't deny it. It's there. And when you acknowledge the pain, pray your pain honestly. Offer yourself up in prayer to God with your naked wounds. Don't dress it up just as it is. God is not turned away by the ugliness of our wounds. Thirdly, in our community, when pain is present, carry each other's burden of pain because we are the presence of God embodied to our brother and our sister. We are the body of Christ, the expression of Christ to one another and to the world. But lastly, not lastly as in last in priority, but this happens to be the last point I want to make. In a sense, it is the greatest of all of these points, that in, in the midst of all our pain, in the midst of all our questions, our unanswerable questions even, we need to trust God and put our hope in Him. Trust in this God who is faithful. Trust in this God who never changes. Trust in this God who, who has, whom He has shown Himself to be in the past, in biblical past, is the God who is and is the God who will be. He never changes. This God who is faithful, this God who is loving, this is the God that we are to trust and we are to put our hope in Him. Shall we pray? As we bow our heads in prayer and I would encourage you to ask and pray the prayer. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me this morning? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you in your present situation? Perhaps in your present pain? And while my Christian brothers and sisters are in conversation with God, I'd like to say something to our non-Christian friends. Uh, if you're not a Christian here and, and you happen to be here in the service, perhaps you are in the kind of situation described somewhere in the sermon. Maybe the song I sang right at the beginning kind of resonates with you. There is a certain loneliness of life. There is a certain emptiness and meaninglessness of life. And I want to say to you that Christ makes sense of my life. And it's when I came to Christ that my life began to heal, as it were. And I want to encourage you to trust in this Jesus. Uh, you may wonder, uh, how do I do that? Well, one way to express your trust in Christ is through a simple prayer. Outline simply as, sorry, thank you, please. Sorry just to simply say that, you're sorry that you've lived life your own way. 
and you would want to live life as Jesus would want you to live. Thank you. Do thank Jesus for what He had done for you and for the offer of a new life that He makes to you. And please, to please, is to invite Jesus into your life and to accept the gift of forgiveness and new life and His Holy Spirit for you. Sorry, thank you, please. There is no set formula. There's just a simple, honest-to-God prayer. You can pray that yourself. But if you like someone to pray that prayer with you, we would love to be able to do that with you. Come up to the front afterwards, and we'll just pray that with you. But you can pray that on your own. And if you do pray that on your own, you know, I want to encourage you to come up to someone and say, hey, I prayed that prayer just now. What do I do next? Okay? And uh, if you just want to talk some more and not ready to pray the prayer, but talk some more with someone, come up to one of us and ask, hey, tell me a little bit more about this Jesus. I'm curious. But to my brothers and sisters in Christ, pain is real. And the pain is a reality of our lives or here on earth. And I think some of us have been suffering in silence, despairing in silence in our lives. And I want to encourage you that God is not absent. God is very present. And your pain is to direct you to Him. Won't you come to Him? You, it might not feel that you are getting many answers, but your coming to Him is the beginning of your healing of the pain, of the lack of the loss that you are suffering. Some of you are dealing with illness, maybe even terminal illness. You're trying very hard to be strong, to be strong for your family because you don't want to burden them. But in your heart, you are in great fear. You're in great pain about the impending end. We want to pray for you. We want to be the body of Christ to you. There are some of us who suffer dysfunction in our homes. Perhaps it's a marriage that is fracturing so badly that you're often wondering if it, if it will ever hold together. And yet because you're a Christian, you've been suffering that pain you've been suffering that pain quietly because you don't want people to know. I want to ask you to come clean with God, so to speak. Come clean with God. Talk to Him. And maybe, if you can, talk to someone else among us. Let us carry some of your burden of pain. There are many kinds of pains. I don't know what your pain is. I don't know what you're going through now. But I want to say this again and again. God is not absent. And God is very much present. And I want to give you the opportunity to have someone minister to you. Pray for you, pray with you. That you would come back to that place where you are able to connect with God. We're going to sing. And as we stand, we're going to ask the pastors to step forward. If the Lord is speaking to you and you really want to pray, someone to pray with you, I encourage you, come forward, let someone pray with you, okay? The pastors and leaders will be here willing to pray with you. So just come as we stand and sing. God, I look to you. I won't be yours. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. 
you where my help comes from give, give me wisdom, wisdom to know just, just what, what to, do. to do god i god look, look to you i won't be overwhelmed give me vision to see things like you do god i look to you you're where my help comes from give, give me, me wisdom to know just what to do, to do. and i will love, love you lord my strength i will love you lord my the Lord is speaking to you, I encourage you to let someone pray with you. Some of you are in need of healing. And that's been your prayer, literally in, in Psalm 13, how long, Lord? How long? And if it's that your prayer, let us pray with you. Let a pastor or a leader pray with you as you deal with the pain of your suffering, in your illness if the pain is in your marriage or your family let someone pray with you don't suffer alone don't think that it's your own, your burden to bear by yourself the Lord put us into a family so that we would live life together and not so that we would do life by ourselves if the Lord is ministering to you let the Lord minister to you through prayer to someone else. Okay, we're going to sing again and then I'm going to close the service. All right? And I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my service in prayer but the area here in front remains open for prayer okay the presence of God doesn't go away uh, the ministry of the people of God doesn't disappear just because we close the service all right so continue to come forward um, take your time are we going to close we're going to close in prayer some of us may not feel comfortable stepping out and yet ready to have someone share our burden but we can bring as it were as I said earlier on we can upload our pain 
to God. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you. You are the God of all comfort. Lord, because Jesus walked this earth, because Jesus walked and suffered many things like we suffer, we have a great high priest who understands what we go through. So, Father, we thank you that you know our pains, that you are not a foreigner to our suffering. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And so, Father, we look to you because you are our hope. We look to you because you are our healer. And then even if our suffering would not end in this life, we thank you that in the life to come, there will be suffering no more. Hallelujah. And so, Father, we pray, let your word occupy our thoughts. May you challenge our hearts. May you tear down our strongholds that are contrary to you and that our thoughts may be aligned to your word. That we will begin and understand to trust you, to walk with you, to see you in our lives, in our everyday. So Lord, as we go from this place to our places of home, school, workplace, college, university, our social places, wherever we go, Father, this is our prayer. May we know the favor of your presence with us in those places. That where we are at, Lord, your blessing may be. That where we are at, we may know your presence to be. Lord, be glorified in us for your own name's sake. To Christ Jesus our Lord, this is our prayer. Amen. 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 <laughs> Celebration's over. But if you want prayer, the front area remains open for prayer. Come, let someone pray with you. If not, the Lord bless you. Have a great week. Hallelujah. Come back next week for what to bring a friend. God bless you all.